a hot July day, right? Yeah. And, and in, in Chicago, in Illinois, there's a black side of town and a white side of town. And apparently, uh, the Michigan River, there's a black side of the river and a white side of the river. And this young boy yeah. was swimming and, uh, on a hot July day because that's what kids do. And what happened to him, Dr. Darity? Yeah, so I think he was a 17-year-old, or approximately so, and he was swimming in Lake Michigan. He's a black kid. He swims to a, across this imaginary dividing line that actually had real functional purpose, apparently, to segregate the waters between where the black folks could swim and where the white folks could swim. And he goes across the line, uh, and he's, he's attacked. Uh, he's attacked uh, and, and ultimately killed by drowning. And uh, folks uh, on the sidelines observe this happening, and the black folks are outraged, uh, and they are imploring the police to do something about the persons who drowned this guy, and the police won't do anything. And that's kind of the trigger for the entire wave of events that followed which essentially, uh, which essentially involve, uh, again, uh, rampaging white mobs that destroy large portions of, of black Chicago. Uh, and I think upwards of about 50 people, black and white, more black folks end up dying uh, during the course of, 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 these, uh, of this turmoil. Uh, and I think it lasted for upwards of almost uh, two weeks. Ultimately, 12 days, the, yeah. 12 days, 12 days yeah, 12 of days, violence. Yeah. Uh, you know, as, yeah, well, as I was days. listening to this story, Dr. Darity, I was struck. First of all, they stoned this boy. They sto- they threw rocks at him until he drowned. They, so they stoned him to uh, death. Yeah. And, and yeah. what was crazy about that is, is when, when people asked for justice, what they got in return was violence. And, right. and a thousand black people were left homeless in Chicago. Now, I don't know what right. that means in today's numbers, but if you imagine you live in a neighborhood where a thousand homes are burnt and destroyed because people wanted justice for a murder of a stoning of a boy just because, I don't know, was there a buoy in the middle of the, of the Michigan River that said this is the black side I, of the river? I, 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 I don't think there was anything there. It's just, you know, you, you have to know that this was where the dividing line was. Uh, but uh, I tried to do a back of the envelope calculation on the value of the property loss, which of course is not as important as the lives that were lost. But uh, I estimate that if we were trying to calculate the value of the homes that were destroyed in the course of the Chicago riot, it would mean in today's dollars uh, a loss of anywhere from 1.75 to uh, 3.5 billion dollars with a b with a b yeah i want i want to sit on that for a second because of of course uh human life is way more valuable than property but the discussion that we must have moving forward when the protests stop is the recompense and the repair the healing and part of the healing the discussion of this healing has to bake in a a a bringing forth of of funds to over, you know, to, to t- make up for what was lost. And over the course of several weeks on this show, I'm committed with you, Dr. Darity, and your co-author, K- Kirsten, to have a discussion about the enormous wealth that was lost at the hands of white violence in this country. And it's important, in this case, in, in Chicago, uh, in July uh, in 1919, which was the year that they call Red Summer, because throughout this country, in America, There were these racial uprisings, these racial uh, acts of terror across the country. I don't know what sparked it. This wasn't the first one, actually. But there were a series during up to 30 black towns decimated in 1919 in America. And then a couple of years later, 1921, Tulsa. Somewhere in between there, there was Rosewood. And... We see this time and time again, but we never talk about the enormous loss, not just of life, but of property and wealth. So the Rosewood massacre actually takes place a little bit after Tulsa, like 1923, I believe. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we do need to to think about 
what the implications are of these massacres for uh, the the present day enormous gap in wealth between blacks and whites. Uh, it's it's a product of American social policies. Some of those policies were active policies to promote the provision of assets to whites while denying blacks those assets. But some of those uh, policies at the federal level have to do with inaction in the midst of these kinds of violent uprisings that uh, resulted in either the destruction or the seizure of black property. So when black folks accumulated property, it frequently was either destroyed or taken away from them. Uh, so we, we do have to think about the contemporary racial wealth gap as a consequence of the way in which social policy has privileged black, uh, white wealth and denied black folks uh, the opportunity to maintain or accumulate additional wealth. Uh, and, uh, you know, the tragedy of the present moment is that we're talking about a situation uh, where black Americans are about 13 percent of the nation's population, but only possess about 2.6 percent of the nation's wealth. Uh, and in relative terms, that's a gap of in excess of 10 trillion dollars uh, that would be required to give blacks a share of the nation's wealth that was comparable to their share in the population. Uh, but that type of disparity is a, is a consequence of American social policy. As I sit here with you, I'm, I'm uh, struck with you, Duke, uh, professor, uh, very well educated, come from a, a, a pretty decent family. I've never been poor a day in my life. I'm sure that there are people listening or people in this country who look uh, at television and all they see are wealthy, well-off black people. Jordan, LeBron, Oprah. There was a, a billionaire that, gave, uh, that forgave debt uh, of students in Morehouse last year, and another one did it this year. What are these black people complaining about? They're, all I see are wealthy rappers, T.I. and Killer Mike. They're wealthy. Look at all of the black wealth. What are they talking about? What do you say to people who will look at uh, a few anomalous cases and then determine that black people have nothing to complain about? So that's the key word uh, that you just used, which is anomalous. Uh, and these cases are exceptions, and they're, uh, they're more dramatic exceptions uh, within the black community than folks with comparable levels of wealth are exceptions within the white population. So let, let me throw out another statistic. I, I guess, you know, that's sort of my, my package of resources for, for these types of conversations. Uh, about 25% of white American households have a net worth in excess of $1 million. It is only 4% of black American families. And so what happens is I think the media frequently provides us with images of those blacks who seem to be doing the, the best financially. Uh, we, we can even think about, you know, the, uh, the imaginary family of the Cosby show living in uh, this hugely expensive brownstone in New York City. Uh, and, you know, this, this is, this is uh, you know, there may be some people who are living like that, but it's, it's, a, it's a tiny, tiny proportion of all black Americans. Uh, and so I think what we need to do is be consistent in comparing the more typical experience of both blacks and whites. And what's interesting about that is the poorest whites actually have more wealth than the typical black. So uh, the, the wow. level of wealth, the median level of wealth, that's possessed by whites who are in the lowest 20% of the income distribution exceeds the median level of wealth for all black Americans taken together. Wow. So what I've asked you to do uh, again with your dense, wonderful, highly researched, powerful book from here to equality is over the next several weeks, join us here to unpack some of these numbers, some of these stories, so that we can get a full picture. Uh, I want to treat this like a classroom. I need folk to pull out their notepads, get their thinking caps on, and let's start to have a conversation around why uh, there needs to be equity, financial equity, why the banks need to pony up money to build, not as a handout, but as a, as, as a repair 
for the damage that was done. And we're going to we're going to lay out what the damage is. And then we're going to make the case on this show. And I, I'm so grateful that you have uh, decided to be a part of this. We're going to have several other people. Mercer uh, Barandaran is also going to be a part of this journey. And we're going to keep having this talk. Jared Ball, we're going to keep having these these discussions because more than just it being about race and racism and, and police brutality, there is an economic repair that has to be addressed and dealt with before we can really heal. And uh, I know this is part of your crusade, so it's definitely part of mine, too. And I thank you for being here. So I, I think about this, uh, and, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I think about this as uh, a question of uh, black Americans' long quest. Uh, these are black American descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. Long quest for full citizenship in the United States. And a component of full citizenship has to do with having an adequate level of material resources to exercise the opportunities that this society claims to promise, but also to participate fully in the political life of this society in, in an effective way. And so uh, that's why one, one of the central reasons I'm so focused on the question of the wealth disparity uh, because I don't believe we can actually have full citizenship without having adequate levels of wealth among black households. Amen. Dr. Darity, uh, people can follow you at Sandy Darity, D-A-R-I-T-Y, on the Twitters from here to equality. He's going to be back here most weeks on a Thrive Thursday to, to unpack this. I appreciate you for, for uh, picking up the, you know, the, the baton and running this race with us here on the Karen Hunter Show. Thank you for being here today. Glad to be here. Take care. All right. You too.